Good morning. Another Tuesday, another Compliance Tuesday session. Some people probably still will be dropping in, but we start at 11. Um, no Mentimeter questionnaire slides today. Uh, there's plenty of slides to discuss. Um, topic today, the machine directive that changed into the machine regulation with the number 2023, the year and the following number, 1230. Easy to remember this one. Um, quite an extensive piece of legislation because it covers an extensive scope of products. A uh, little bit about us. If you don't know us, we offer professional support in the implementation and executing of product and supply chain compliance. And we do that mainly for non-food consumer products. There's a few options to go outside the scope for enterprise users. And the main reg regions that we cover with our regulatory database are EU and countries that follow the EU and the UK market. We are not a lab, we're not an NGO, we're not a sourcing platform. We don't have, we have an opinion on legislation, but we're not going to Brussels and say you should do A or B or C, but we, we track it and follow it. And um, we do that since uh, 2009. And in the meantime, with a team of 60 people. Um, you're listening to me. I'm Gaspar, and I'm one of the two founders of Project IP. You might have run into a Project IP noticing a logo on the helmet of this amazing woman, woman called Kimberly Boss. There's a local hero from our head office town. She's an Olympic medal, bronze medal winner and uh, second of the world last year. Uh, her season will start soon again via our website. We'll uh, keep you posted on her progress in this season. Uh, compliance Tuesday sessions, we do that already, I would say for about maybe 12, 13 years. Um, the main reason is that if we inform you a little bit better and explain the different lingo that is used in legislations, then it's easier to work with you and it's easier for you to work with Project IP. Um, you need to have a basic understanding of certain things. And when you first entering the world of product compliance, you'll probably be overwhelmed, but you probably, when you start working in it and use Compliance Tuesday sessions and Project IPDA knowledge, recognize that there are quite some patterns. There's a logic in everything. So understanding the problem is a little bit going to help you and therefore also helping us. Um, Compliance Tuesdays by no means are legal advice and are also not going into the very nitty gritty of all kinds of legislation. It's like a pressure cooker session or an overview and gives you an idea what will be on your road. We start uh, this year almost every session from Station Brussels, where we call it the tsunami that is coming from Station Brussels. The European Commission is using the analogy of a train station to explain what they are doing and why they are doing it. They have created six platforms at the European legal train station, from Green Deal to a new push for European democracy. And there's tremendous amount of trains going to depart or already depart or arrive back at the station. And those trains are pieces of legislation. So it's quite interesting, this kind of analogy. You can actually dive into it. Uh, the link is uh, in the presentation that will be uh, shared with you probably tomorrow. Uh, last week, Compliance Tuesday will also be shared with you tomorrow. Uh, we have a new means of sharing so that you can download it. Um, there's tremendous no amount of trains, 584. So that's why we call it a, a tsunami. Um, you cannot outrun it, but if you are in the business, I advise you to ride the wave and be ahead of the pack and get some energy out of it. Uh, but it probably means sometimes making tough decisions. This machine regulation is arrived, that train in July of this year, uh, and it was in a Europe fit for the digital age. Whoa. Okay, it's not always make sense, those platform names. Um, although there are in the machine regulation, a lot of aspects that have to do with digital. 
both on the supply chain side as in the product side. So let's see if we can put this platform, put, put this train on this platform from a logic point of view. What has changed? Well, there's various slides on, on that. First of all, it was a directive and now it's a regulation. Is that relevant? Oh, it is very relevant. Um, a directive, and you will see also a lot of the initially created legislations when the European Union was found. Uh, a directive there is a, means that there is a goal that all the EU member states agree on, but every individual member state uses their own national legislation to achieve that goal. So it means the goal is the same. The way they achieve it could be very different per member state. And obviously, in one Europe, we would like to have more harmonized approach. And regulations are such a way to reach things in a harmonized way. So the goal is the same, but also the way to reach that goal is the same. Will there be differences in legislation when it when a regulation is transformed into national law? Because it's always transformed into national law. Mm, it's just a translation. And there might be national parts that say the warnings will be like this, or the warnings will be like that, or the, the, the market surveillance authorities in our country are A and in another country are B. But the basic principles of how to reach the goals are the same. That is important because from a business point of view, you would like to have what is called level playing field. The same rules applying everywhere. Uh, the scope of the machine directive is quite impressive. Um, and having said that, what is not in the scope is also quite impressive. It's, um, it's quite complex. You know, a washing machine is not a machine, but it is a machine, but not a, not a machine under the MD. Uh, but a folding electrical bicycle is. So to keep track of scope is one of the things that our regulatory team is doing. Uh, if you use product AP, you will not uh, fail to see a product in scope A or B or C. It will always be in the correct scope. But obviously, machines are in the scope of the machine directive. Also are things that they call interchangeable equipment. Um, why is that? But for example, Tractors, forestry uh, products are not in the scope of the machine directive. They have their own. But sometimes you have a machine that can be powered by a tractor, something that you can add on. And those in interchangeable equipments are part of the machine directive. Safety components that are not part of the machine, but will be used in, in, in association with the machine to establish a safe machine, are also in the machine directive. Oh, what is that? Okay, uh, maybe something like a, a screen that works with light sensors and the moment you walk in those light sensors, the machine switches off like a safety screen. So that's a safety components. You can, you can see it like switches for an electrical appliance also are covered by the low voltage directive. Right? So you can see safety components that are intended to act as a safety component for a machine are covered by the machine directive. A very interesting category is lifting and lifting accessories. So chains, ropes, webbing, it's all part of machine directive. Removable mechanical transmission devices is also part of the machine directive. Again, there are a lot of things that you can add on other appliances and they basically work as, a, as an engine. They're also part of the scope. What is new in the scope, which was out there in the market, eh, it's one of the reasons why sometimes regulations or directives are updated is because they need to be in sync with what is happen, happening in the market, are partly completed machines. So these are things that you need to assemble yourself and connect basically from maybe different kits and the only thing that is still missing to run it is software and that needs to be added. Uh, quite complex machines sometimes, but if you look at what's happening in production, because machines is not just consumer products, these are also machines that are working in a factory. Um, it's, all, it's all in the scope, quite complex, yeah? <laughs> if you look at definitions, uh, I, I'm just taking the main one 
an assembly fitted with or intended to be fitted with a drive system other than directly applied human or animal effort. So everything that is actually getting energy from something that is not human or animal, like a spring, spring operated, is also a machine. Um, if you look at the definitions and, and other definitions, I really advise you to just download the PDF. We'll probably add the English version of the PDF to the download set for this presentation so you can have a look at it. Definitions are quite complex. And when the thing's complex, there are also excep exceptions. Um, exceptions to the be fitted with a drive system other than applied by human or animal effort. For example, lifting equipment. Lifting equipment is manually powered. Is Well, it can be manually powered, but manually powered machinery intended for lifting loads, goods or persons are also part of the machine directive. Um, a typical example are jacks that you use to lift your car when you have a flat tire. Um, it's obviously that it's quite an extensive work to keep track of all this and exceptions and changes in that. So if you use Protepi, you're covered by the expertise of our regulatory team that keeps track of all of this. Um, and if you and if you're a skizzer jack, uh, which is quite a, a common product for a recall, it is not able to do what it should do, and you are under your car, and this one is not keeping your car up, then you have a serious problem. And that is why, if you look at recalls EU and on the EU safety gate websites, machines are quite often on the recalls because if things go wrong, uh, you often have directly an injury somewhere. Yeah. Um, you put I put the links there. You can you can search on machines yourself. It's a category in the uh, in the RAPEC safety gate. Um, accessories to machines or retrofit uh, that actually have an influence of, on machines that are already out there are also part of machine directive, um, which means that if they don't comply, then you have a recall. This is one example. Um, the list of recalls with this product is endless. Um, there's no safety devices on the existing equipment um, that can withstand anything that is, you know, flipping off these kind of blades. Um, these are like knives. Uh, there's also another kind of a product, which is like a circular saw blade that you can fit into an angle grinder. That retrofit is also not allowed. Uh, the list with these kind of recalls is really endless. Um, read more about this on our compliance clip. You can download it here. And we'll put, probably put that one in the download set ourselves. There's quite a number of interesting compliance clips on Proitopedia that, uh, that could help you to keep, keep insights. It's not just small machines, it's also very large machines. This is a huge milling machine that is used in, um, in the production of steel parts. And this one has actually a very famous brand name. You have probably seen them driving on a Formula One, Formula One circuit uh, last weekend. The, the Haas uh, team has actually a, the largest machine tool manufacturer in the US. Uh, recalls can happen to anyone and the machine directive applies to anyone. Um, so if you, th if you think this is not going to happen to me, well, just think the other way around. What, what if it will happen to me? And can I keep track of information? And can I demonstrate that I've been in control and can I participate with market surveys authorities? Another part in the scope are those safety components. And new is here that it also says software can be a safety component. And now it probably starts to make sense why this was on the platform ready for a digital age. It's obviously that software either can influence the behavior of a machine, um, even software that can be downloaded later right, or up updated via the internet or updated via another means. Um, and sometimes software can be the one that says, okay, I detect a human being and therefore I just now shut down. Yeah. So software cannot be ignored as a safety component, but it is a very complex piece of material to register and keep track. So 
Um, the scope, if the, if the failure or malfunction of endangering the safety of a person, uh, that's obviously for any mechanical safety component, but it's also for software. So you can have a recall because a software update is actually endangering the safety of persons. Yes. Every piece of legislation has essential requirements. And if you stack essential requirements, then you have a basis to cover what's called an assumption of compliance with essential requirements. And the machine directive has essential requirements and they're written down in Annex 3. And where sometimes the essential requirements are very basic, for example, in the REACH legislation, pr protection of the humans and the environment against the influence of chemical substances. Okay, that's very basic, it's one line. For the machine directive, it has six chapters and it has multiple pages. Um, and that is because machines have so many different aspects. But in the core, the machine should not compromise health and safety of persons and where appropriate domestic animals and property and environment. So it's very, very broad. And when you start reading Annex 3, those six chapters, they, they completely make sense because it has to do with um, all kinds of aspects during using the, using the machine, even uh, giving shade. Yeah, If you have a windmill and it gives shade, the environment is also part of that. Noise is part of that. Yeah, uh, Very complex, very extensive, but complex in the combination. If you read it all, it does it really does make sense okay not all those inf not all that information that is there is always applicable to all machines but some machines can be very complex what they have done also is updating modernizing the supply chain roles and aligning them with for example the 2019 1020 the market surveillance regulation that already was released in 2019 covering supply chain roles for people that sell computers and power banks and other products with CE. Um, it was necessary because the, the market surveillance approach on machines was a little bit different. I'll come to that in two or three slides. So you will see supply chain roles and recognize them because they're not different anymore than they were in other pieces of legislation. So you can say machines have their a little bit their own framework. So you need to design them and construct them safely. So inherently design them and construct them safely. You need to keep track. You need to document it all. You need to carry out the relevant conformity assessments. So there will be, depending on machine types, a part where you have to look at, does the construction comply with what is written in harmonized standards? That would be the easy way. And if there's no harmonized standards, can we build a assessment program together with notified bodies and how are we maintaining conformity during mass production that's of course interesting because it's oh, it might be difficult to get one approved but it's even more difficult to make a hundred thousand in the same way machines sometimes become a machine on location so it's like a production site somewhere making for a car manufacturer that's also a machine a complete production line so you will see in the machine regulation things that are really not applicable to most of retail trade, but that's why the scope of the machine regulation is so broad. There has to be a declaration of conformity, and there are documentary and information requirements on the product, on the manual. Uh, there's traceability requirements, the usual stuff. What if you import a product that is branded by someone outside the EU, that is allowed, of course, but then it needs to be clear who is that brand owner outside the EU and who are you as importer. So this is a similar kind of scope if you would import luminaires or power banks. It's not different anymore. As an importer, you need to have access. Basically, you should have looked at the technical documentation provided by the brand owner outside the EU. And what if you are a distributor? A distributor is a store online or brick and mortar. Then you need to look at, is the information on and accompanied with the product 
uh, in line with the languages of the countries that I'm selling the product. So don't sell a, a product with just German translations and manual in France, um, because like you and me, we like to read stuff in our own language. Yeah. Um, and often a distributor online or brick and mortar are the ones that are in contact with the end user. So you play a vital role in collecting potential market uh, situations. So, you know, you, you receive notifications of customers saying, hey, I was using this machine and X, Y, Z happened. And you need to collect that and you need to pass that on to importers and brand owners. So you are important in the information role. Uh, it was not mentioned before, but it is mentioned obviously now also a fulfillment service provider. If it's if you are a fulfillment service provider, that means if you ship goods to end users that you don't own, so you ship goods to end users in in, um, as, in, in assigned by uh, by me by somebody who owns the product. So you ship them and label them. If there's no EU address on that product the fulfillment service provider becomes the EU address. So it's like you running a store and inside the store are all white boxes. Then you as store are the brand. So that's why fulfillment service providers in various areas are paying so much attention and stressing out to everybody in the supply chain. Be careful, ensure that there is an EU address on the product because otherwise I cannot ship your product. Yeah. So it was mentioned in many pieces of legislation as well, and that's not different now in the machine regulation. What is very relevant, if you look at especially directive and regulation, is the way market surveillance was acting. So it's not the same in every member state, but market surveillance previously was mainly focusing on when machines were being used. So you can say it was environmental health and safety related. So they went on a building side and they see people working with machines and had an opinion about that. Um, this could, by the way, vary per EU member state. In the regulation, however, it's been written clearly that it should be the same way as with other products in other pieces of legislation. The manufacturer slash brand owner is responsible for product compliance. Having said that, the employer is still responsible for EHS. Yeah, that, that, is, that is still there. So actually they shifting or making, making it legally more possible for market surveillance to act with respect to machines in the same way as that they should do for other products. And as per previous slide, maybe in some member state, it was already arranged in that modern way, but now it is legally written down that this can be and this has to be done in all the member states. I think it's important. Well, another piece of software, cybersecurity. Ah, security is also a duty of the manufacturer. And uh, this this time they, they, they call it cybersecurity. So interaction uh, via the internet or interaction via any other means of software updates or USB sticks should not lead to risks. Okay, so you need to consider, can this machine be hacked? And if this is, will be hacked or be tampered with, what could happen? Quite a challenge for some. Um, we were always being used to say, uh, there's high risk machines, look at Annex 4. Um, they reshuffle the annexes. That's, I wouldn't have done it, but they did it. Um, doesn't make sense. People always talk about Annex 4 then why change it to something else? But the high risk machines are now in Annex 1 and there's a part A and a part B. You will see in the next slide, there's a limited number of six categories on A and there's a tremendous amount of articles or machines already on B. On B. What is relevant is that this list is not as it is printed today. The, um, the European Commission has given themselves a right to make this list dynamic and they can do that via a so-called delegated act. They don't do it secretly, but they can publish a delegated act to the machine regulation and then update an annex or update the scope of the high-risk machines. 
that makes it a little bit complex to monitor that, um, but that is uh, what, what we do, of course. Um, those high-risk machines could require involvement of notified bodies for type approval. Yeah, so have a look at, is the construction uh, as according to what it should be with harmonized standards and or involvement of notified body in monitoring mass productions? Yeah. There are options that you can choose and how much they need to be involved, but they have to be involved. I'll take you along this six categories of the Annex 1 Part A. The removable mechanical transmission devices is there, including guards, guards for removable transmission devices. Yeah, if guards are there included, then guards are there included. Vehicle servicing lifts, that is, that is uh, the ones that used in garage to lift your car. Portable cartridge operating, fixing, and other impact machinery, safety components with fully or partially self-evolving behavior using machine learning approaches ensuring safety functions. That is a new one. Uh, so you have machines that have software that is self-learning, and that self-learning software is a safety aspect. That is interesting. Um, there, there is actually an interesting case written down in the legislation about a, uh, a laser welding robot that uh, has a visual recognition of uh, persons. It can recognize human beings and it's becoming better and better in recognizing it. And that's good because you don't want to be laser welded when you're walking around. The interesting fact in that case is that actually people that are in that factory, they're not sure if they like this machine or not. You know, if, if a machine has a safety screen that is very v visually clear, then you know that this is the barrier. But if you need to trust that he will see you if you are walking in a virtual barrier or not. Okay, that is a different kind of emotion. You don't want to be laser welded in that sense. Um, that, that is the same for number six, partially self-evolving behavior using machine learning. So these two are, are new. We cannot stop that technology. The, the, that technology is there and uh, um, and it Ultimo will outsmart us in, in certain ways. Um, and hopefully nobody will misuse it via hacking it. The part B, well, we only have uh, another 30 minutes. That, that list is too long. You really need to, uh, to read it uh, yourself. This Annex 1, as said, it can and will be amended per decisions of the European Commission. Um, for you, to give you an idea, of course, we will monitor those delegated acts and update the Product AP regulatory database. We are, at this moment, at an average of 400 updates a month. Uh, so. Good luck if you want to continue wasting your time and energy on Googling that. Digital machines is also new, software is new. Um, there are a lot of machines that have a lot of functionalities that come from software. So software updates and how you are dealing with that definitely needs to be part of a consideration. Um, again, Maybe today, this is not for the average machine that you and I are using as a consumer. But if you look at the world of today in the world 10 years ago, and if you look at the world in probably five years from now, there will definitely be smart things coming into regular consumer machines that help help actually the user. Yeah, it, could, it might be saying this one needs to be cleaned, this part needs to be replaced, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? And it could be learning. Note that the artificial intelligence part in the digital machine part of the machine directive is not the same as related to the new European artificial intelligence regulation. No, it's not aligned as such. What about the software? Well, I told you already it, is, it can be defined as a safety component. Then, then you need to document it very well. Uh, that, that can be um, quite tricky. Um, how to document, how to write it down can be extensive. Uh, need to be understandable for market surveys, authorities, how it works. But the, the next step is even more relevant. You need to keep track of changes because otherwise you don't have like a version management. It's like 
I'm, I'm shipping a machine with a production batch and the software update is actually another batch. And this track of version management need to be on the machine itself. And it's called the safety PLC, a programmable logical controller. Um, obviously you cannot delete that information. So if something goes wrong, you need to, need to, be, need to be able to establish which production batch of the original machine was it and on which version of software it was running. Does it make sense? I think it makes sense. People that make machines probably will buy safety PLC pieces of hardware and software that keep track of version management. You know, it, it, it is it is probably a quite a discipline to have a software update structure on a machine, like, like it's a mechanical component, it will be like a software component. But don't forget this, if you buy machines that have software and software updates, and there is no way to keep track of on what software it's running, then it's not according, not okay according to the new machine regulation. Make sense? Makes sense. What if we have a machine, but we modify the machine because we want to use it in a little bit of different way than we did before? Um, this could probably not be for consumer products, but more or less for um, machines running in factories. Although if you sell products that actually lead to a modification of a machine, then you need to consider it as well. This is called retrofit. But um, the logic that is here, it makes sense. You just wonder why they haven't written it down before. But if you are modifying a machine or a part of a machine and it's going to be used in a way not foreseen originally, then it makes sense that the authorities say this would make you require to have a new risk assessment. And that could mean even new tests and as a result, a new compliance declaration. So key here is you're modifying a machine that already has been placed on the market in a way not being planned or foreseen by the manufacturer. And it makes sense because it will make you the manufacturer of the new machine. Yeah. And the old one cannot be held responsible for your modification. This substantial modification is completely logic. It was just not written down very clearly and it's more written down clearly now. Now everybody applauding, we don't need paper. Well, you don't need, but probably people can still ask for paper. But it makes sense that we move towards a non-digital manual. Um, it's allowed to make it digital. The key elements of the manual, let's say the quick guide, the quick user guide with the basic safety instructions needs still to be on paper as part of the product. The digital version need to be available also to store offline. So most likely it will be a PDF. And additionally to that, you can of course also have all kinds of videos, maybe videos that you can be download. Maybe some brands will make an app that allow offline information to be looked at, but offline is relevant. How to download instructions need to be clear on product and packaging and need to be available for 10 years or maybe for some machines even longer. Note the QR product IP link to a public file, the, the future of the digital product passport yeah, or the, the past of the future digital product passport uh, is perhaps a good way to use that because those URLs will be there for the next 10 years. There are a lot of aspects that you need to look at when when you do an evaluation of machines. And it's, it's again, product compliance Tuesdays are about lingo. Machine regulations is using what they call an ABC standards framework. It's a layered type of standards framework. That means there are different standards, different group of standards addressing different levels of products and they are referring to each other. And the basis are the A standard. They are basic safety standards and they arrange, uh, they talk about hazards related to mechanical hazards, to vibration, to temperatures. Because you and I, for, if you talk about temperatures, you and I, we burn us at a certain temperature on a certain surface, regardless if this machine is machine A or B or C. Our skin just cannot withstand certain temperatures. Our ears simply should be protected against noise on a certain level. So 
it doesn't make sense to address all those basic hazards in each and every standard. And that's why they use them in the basic safety standard. This is the A category of standard. There's only a few of them. And the most widely applied is the EN ISO 12100. They probably don't change a lot anymore yeah, because uh, we, we as humans don't change a lot anymore. Then the next level are the ones that are talking about generic safety standards. So what are safety distances that people should have when there is a moving robot? Or if you want to operate a machine and you want to prevent that people have their hands under a press, then you have something like a two-hand control. So how to, how to design a proper two-hand control or how to design a proper safety guard? Why you want to have those kind of solutions to certain risks in each and every product standard? You don't. These are the B-type standards. There's around 100 harmonized B-type standards. And the last level are the very machine specific standards they come in a part a uh, sorry a part one and a part two with a certain dash so the part two with a certain number are very specific for a certain machine they combine them with the part a and those standards refer again back on certain aspects to consider relevant solutions provided in b and a there are around a thousand harmonized c-type standards that is an incredible number of standards. So if you look at compliance of machines, you look at the mix of A, B, and C. Those harmonized standards, harmonized means everybody in the EU agrees that these are the best standards. Um, we need to start to pay attention to them. Um, if the products are in Annex 1, then you need to have a notified body involvement to check if the product complies with, with, with harmonized standards. If they're not in Annex 1, then you can do it yourself, but you must use harmonized standards. Okay, that sounds normal. The thing is, there are 800 plus standards that probably need to be re, I call it re-harmonized under the new regulation. And everybody that we speak to and all the information that we, re we read ourselves is that people doubt that the European Commission will be able to reharmonize all those standards under the new regulation. And if they're not reharmonized on time, then you cannot use them for um, applying compliance by yourself. And if you cannot use harmonized standards, then you need to go to a notified body. And there are not enough notified bodies to take care of that part of the work because they're not intended to do that. So when we look to the machine regulation and would summarize, summarize it, then one of the things that we think you should start to monitor, um, will reharmonization of standards be on time or not? Uh, there's still quite an extensive transition period, 32 months. But uh, um, th this this case, the, the market will need every every minute of that. Um, and if not, how will this perhaps force you to use an notified body? Or will the European Commission say you can still use those standards yourself? Software and artificial intelligence are new topics. They might be far away from you today for different machines, but I think software is definitely something that will be added to products and AI as well. Why I say that? Because the non-food product and market development is always like, let's combine all kinds of features. Yeah, And uh, um, th this will make things more complex than today. Supply chain roles, it's actually easier. They are aligned with what we are used to for other frameworks. Same for market surveillance. Yeah? The digital manual is, a, is, I think, it's a very interesting development. Interesting if this would be the, the trial case for similar solutions in other product categories. So why, why not a digital manual for a washing machine or a refrigerator in the future as well? And so it's quite an interesting development. 
By the way, talking about manuals, just want to highlight that Perkopi is market leader when it comes to checking product packaging and manual artwork. We have a website page on that where you can find more information about that. Um, it's surprisingly difficult to make proper product packaging and manuals. It requires a tremendous ownership of you and your supply chain partners. But the good thing is, if you have that ownership on product labeling, packaging information and manuals, it has a profound effect, positive effect on the way you and your supply chain partners are dealing with product compliance because it's, it requires ownership and keeping track of versions of manuals and packaging. Um, I really recommend this also in my risk assessment training. This is really a, a piece where you can start, you know, becoming more professional and, 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 and it will have a great benefit for everybody. Some of you might be in Hong Kong next month. Uh, I will be there, Martin will be there, Alice will be there, Shanice will be there, uh, Ken will be there. So for my Hong Kong team, people will be there as well. Um, if you are on the Global Sources Consumer Electronics Show, have a look at us, have a cup of coffee, and have a chat. And uh, looking forward to meet you if you are there next month. That's it for today. Um, this PDF will be available for a download and, and probably this uh, the English PDF of the regulation and the compliance clip probably tomorrow. We'll send you an email with a, a link to a page where you can download it. Are there any questions that you would like to ask? You can put them in the chat. If not, then I wish you a fantastic remaining Compliance Tuesday. Keep calm, stay compliant. Um, if you come up with questions after this meeting, you know how to reach us, uh, our team or my colleagues and uh, look forward to support you with your continued success selling machines in the EU market. Bye-bye for now.